It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Behind the wheel of a classic car. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Oh. The aim, to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. Doubled up there. There'll be worthy winners. £1,700. Yay! And valiant losers. Also! <laughs> Will it be the high road to glory? Loving it, loving it, loving it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> this is the Antiques Road Trip. Oh, yes. Welcome, one and all, to Scrumptious Somerset. Cider for supper? Yeah. For lunch. <laughs> Uh, steady. Listen to this, Margie. Ready? Yeah. Hey. How about that? What a revy tail. That's right, it's a Jaguar. Jaguar XK150. <laughs> it's Paul Martin <laughs> and Margie Cooper in their delectable strawberry jam red 1958 convertible. Yeah, so Clint Eastwood drives one of these. Really? Yeah, could you imagine doing this road trip on Route 66? Yeah. So, you and Clint Eastwood, eh? Me and Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> My older brother. <laughs> like peas in a pod. Well, this is our first time on the road together, Mike. It is. Are you quite competitive? Well, everybody wants to win, don't they? Yeah. Nobody wants to, to be a loser. <laughs> <laughs> loser! That's loser. me! <laughs> Refined, aren't they? Cheshire-based dealer Margie's a veteran road tripper and queen of the quirky. I don't think we can use it for... Oh... Yeah, bird bath. Put your fruit in it. After you. Paul, the famous flogger from nearby Wiltshire, with only one other outing under his belt, is a man of many parts. I'm good at spending money. Well, that's good news. They're setting off from Somerset, taking in the coast of North Devon before cruising through Cornwall with a final showdown in Devon. There's my indicator. Oh, is it? Yeah, where is it? There. Oh, right. Whoops. <laughs> oh, I filmed it. Oh, we've got a tractor coming as well. <laughs> got double, double trouble. Yikes. On this inaugural trip, their items will be auctioned in Winchcombe, but business begins in the ancient market town of Shepton Mallet. Did you know John Lewis of department store fame was born here in 1836? Well, now you do. With £200 each to spend, our antiqueurs are heading their separate ways. Margie's hitting antiques and interiors at number nine with Barry on hand if she needs anything. Definitely eclectic mix, Barry. Very much so, isn't it? <laughs> keeps, keeps you busy for a few minutes. <laughs> well. I should Coco. Wow, that's a whopper, isn't it? This letterbox. So tell me about that. Is it? What's it made of? They're made of fiberglass. Is it? Yes, they have reported to be coming off of a film set. So it's a matching pair, yeah? Oh yeah, absolutely. If you want to. <laughs> um, greedy. <laughs> so just out of interest, how much are those? Well, he's got three nine five on them, but you know. As a pair? No, no, unfortunately. Oh, each. Mm. Oh crumbs! I, I think I'll keep walking. Yeah. That's a well-delivered message, Margie. Ooh, nice riding boots. If you can imagine, if you're wanting the cosy country look in a house... Yeah. ..you'd put those by the door, or you'd put them by the fireplace, and it's just something, something to decorate and to talk about, isn't it? They've maybe been used for, in hunting or whatever. Everything's got a history. And those are, like, what, 50 years old? They look good, though, don't you think? Yes. Stylish. Very nice. Right, move on. OK, we will. Paul's across town in Parkway's Antiques, with £200 burning a hole in his pocket. Anything tickling your fancy, dear boy? Mmm. Bit of Royal Dalton, a great name in English ceramics. Indeed. Now, for me, that's a bit steep. That's £75. That's a no, then. And that silver plate, that is quite nice. I do like that. It's a tea caddy, but look, it's in the shape of top hat. This is, I would say, circa 1920. It's been hand hammered from this side. So basically, this image has been carved into a piece of wood and then the plate is laid onto it and hammered. So you can feel the undulations from the inside where it's pushed through. <laughs> 
It's good, actually. I mean, it's a nice centrepiece. It's a nice-looking thing. With £120 on the ticket, that's a big chunk of your kitty. Time to move on. Let's hop back to Margie. This is a tea box, but it's got more than tea in it. Green tea, black tea, mixing bowl. But in this mixing bowl, <laughs> we've got a little collection of Festus. Look at that. That's really nice. If that was silver, it'd be worth a fortune. Oink, oink. But it's not, it's plate. And that's an interesting little thing, too. Another Vesta, is it? This is a... Oh, God, this is good. This is a, a combination of a Vesta and a stamp case. Look. <laughs> I quite like that, that, and that. I wonder if Barry would do me a deal. That would be on the piggy the silver and leather one and the combination Vesta and stamp book. Hang on, I think she spotted something else. Oh, it's the corner covers. This is so sweet. This is an Edwardian one. This is about 120 years old. And people walk past them. Can you see the inlaid decoration? Love this shape with a brass little beveling. No price on it. You hear that old glass it has a different sound, very tinny. So this is about circa 1900. Mm. Right, I'm going to ask Barry about that. Now, Barry, I was going to come to you with those. Oh, you the deer. Yeah. yeah, I walked straight past it. That lovely Edwardian corner cupboard. It's an amazing piece of furniture for uh, any time, really, isn't it? But just don't fetch the prices, so you're into a bargain. Oh, no. So I am. Um, into a bargain? Yeah. Bargain like what? I think we could do that for 35. Oh, and that will give you a chance. Oh, well, that would. That's super. Now, what about the Vesta collection? So what sort of price are we going for? The pig is beautiful, I think. Yeah. Um, had it been silver, we'd have been talking a lot of money. I would think if you have the price that's on there, then we could do something with it. Oh, I haven't got a ticket on that. I think that one was on at 30 originally. That'd be 15. The stamp and... Vesta box, which that's 20, so that's a tenner. Yeah. And that was what, 30? Yeah, so 15. Ah, so that's <laughs> twice 15 and a tenner, 40 pounds. Well, call it 35 and have, have the pair for 70. That's great. Can we have a deal? We do have a deal. Excellent. That's very kind indeed. Do you want some money? I'd love some money. <laughs> well done, Margie. That's two lots all wrapped up and 130 pounds still to spend. For Paul, it's all roses on the other side of town. Oh, this reminds me of my mum and dad. They collect Devonware. Oh, they used to love their Devonware. Ah, uh, what's not to love? Basically, the clay around Torquay is just ripe for doing this sort of wares. You know, that's why it's known as the Torquay Terracotta. These items are vintage Whatcom pottery, also known as motto wear. I think that's really nice. I love that cockerel. It's got one or two cracks, which does devalue it a lot, but that's the kind of thing that I would buy. And if I buy it, then I know a lot of other people would. And this is quite nice as well. The jug's in good condition. The best way to have a friend is to be one. No prices. Pauline? I picked out that milk jug. How much is that? Uh, 25. And the one with the little chip in is 10. Okay. <laughs> if I bought the two, would you do the two for 25 pounds? Yes, I could. Yes. Thank you, Pauline. And with that, Paul's off. Actually, I've just spotted something. Or is he? Big old dog. I like that. That's a Victorian steel engraving, which has been hand-coloured. So it is a print. It's in its original frame. Pauline, how much is that? 25, because it's just a print. Would you do 20? Go on, then. Thank you. I'm going to buy that. I'll give you 20 quid. I'm not buying any more. I'm really, really going now. This is my last buy. £45 for all the three items, leaving Paul with £155 for later on. Oh. Meanwhile, lucky old Margie's ended up near Warminster on a rather marvellous adventure. 
It all begins with the tale of how a stately home was saved from ruin by one man, with help from a circus owner and the most unlikely of attractions. His curator, James Ford. Hello, James. Hi there, Margie. Do tell me about this wonderful house. Well, this is Longleat House, which was completed in 1580, and it was built by Sir John Thin. Thin had purchased a former priory on this site in 1541 for £53, <laughs> uh, which was a huge amount of money nearly 500 years ago. Sir John was in the lofty position of steward to Edward Seymour, uncle to the heir to the throne. And as his master's power and wealth grew, so did Thin's, enabling him to pour money and time into the creation of this magnificent mansion. Nothing had looked like this before in England. The sheer mass and symmetry of Longleat House was unique at the time. The use of glass over the, all the facades was really groundbreaking as well. But where Jonathan really made new ground was on the introduction of classical detailing inspired by Renaissance Italy. And the house has been in the family ever since, through 16 generations, who were to be titled the Marquises of Bath. Ah, but it hasn't been easy. After the Second World War, Henry Thin, the sixth Marquis, faced enormous death duties. Many similar estates were being sold off, but Henry was determined not to lose Longleat. They came up with a really quite extraordinary idea of opening the doors of his private home to the paying public. And this was the first stately home to become a commercial visitor attraction. The first? The very first, yeah. So in 1949, he opened the doors and the response was incredible. It was incredibly popular. 140,000 people came in the first year. The real extraordinary development came in the mid-1960s when Lord Bath teamed up with a man called Jimmy Chipperfield, who yeah. was from a, a famous circus family, and they decided to introduce 50 lions. 50? 50 lions into part of the, the Capability Brown designed parkland here yeah. at Longleat yeah. and opened the very first safari park outside of Africa. And since then, the lions of Longleat have been joined by more than 1,200 other animals. And literally millions of people have come to visit the 9,000 acre estate, including Armaji with safari park warden Ian Turner. Oh, big cats. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm excited to see them roaming about. Oh, they have beautiful colour. Look at them. Oh, and they're basking in the sunshine. Oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, look at their little faces. Although the animals were initially brought in to boost the family's finances, their conservation quickly became a top priority. In another corner of the park, Rothschild giraffes thrive and breed. It's a vital lifeline for the endangered species, with only around 2,500 remaining in the wild. They've had over 120 births. So, you know, you're serving everybody, the public, conservation... Yeah, I mean, no, no giraffes should ever come from the wild anymore, because we've got We've bred so many and they've been distributed to all zoos and safari parks all over the world. They seem very gentle animals. Very gentle, quite nervy animals. Yeah. You've got to be quite quiet around them and they're very nosy to see what's going on in the world. Can I, can I feed them? Yeah. Got my, I brought my gloves. Yeah, if you all put your right. gloves on, as you can see, they're really keen. No, I'm feeding you. Don't do it yourself. Right, who's first? You're a bit cheeky, aren't you? Yeah, are you ready? You ready, oi! <laughs> <laughs> She's a natural, isn't she? Oh, uh, no, you're not doing that. No, no, get off. No, no, I'm feeding you. You're not going in the thing. Oh, God! <laughs> I wonder what the sixth Lord Bath would have thought if he could see this. What indeed? His phenomenal forward thinking not only saved the house and the estate, but has led to the conservation and protection of 37 endangered species for future generations to enjoy and protect. <laughs> am I teasing you? I am, aren't I? Let's leave Margie to it and find out what Paul's up to on the short drive to his next shop. Uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm stalling! No, I've stalled the Jaguar! Help! Oh, dear! He's supposed to be heading to Castle Kerry. 
There was a castle here in the 12th century, but now it boasts a pretty town centre and botanica antiques with a mix of, well, all sorts, actually, in the capable hands of Steve. There you go. Watch your head, man. Oh. This is nice. Modern power generators. That's quite nice. The illustrations in this book fold out. They don't necessarily pop up, but they're beautifully hand-coloured illustrations. As you can see, you can fold them up so you can get to different layers and different levels of the locomotive. It's an engineer's dream, really. So it's full of beam engines, steam engines, turbines. I'm just going to look at the spines. The spines are very, very good. Which is important, because if the binding is damaged, it won't hold the pages and the book will be devalued. There's hardly any damage to these at all. There's a little bit of foxing. That's just dampness. But nothing's been removed. Nothing's been scribbled on. <laughs> There's two volumes to peruse, if this is your thing. I mean, look at that. That's a piston engine, and that will be just swinging backwards and forwards. I'd say these books are 1950s, 1960s, 60s at the very latest. I can't find a price on them. I'd like to think these would be around about... £10 each, £15 each, maybe. I think those are a must. Books are on track, man. I do like little boxes, but not that one. Hmm, a sort of a, a late art deco door knocker. Might not be quite 1920s, more like 1950s. But I tell you what, there's some weight in that brass door knocker. It's a good casting, it's definitely English. That's okay as well, that's the bit that screws through the door, bolts through the door, that bolts through the door and it clangs on that. It's generous, you know, you, when you get to a front door and you want to go, do, 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 hello, is anyone in? That is what you call a good door knocker. Price tag says £32. Let's go and see Steve and see if I can knock him down a bit. Boom, boom. Ah, Steve. Ah, Paul. Look, I have found a couple of things. These yep. two volumes, the modern power generators. I love those. Sure. Yeah, and the illustrations are superb and they yeah, fold they out. Are. What sort of money are they? Um, I've got 50 on those for the pair. What's the very, very best? 35. I found this lovely door knocker. It's, yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's yeah. good casting. Yeah, yeah it, there's not a, a great deal of age to it. Oh, I could do that for 20. 20 and? If I did 15 on those and 30 on those, 45 quid for the pair. That's a deal. Thank you very much. No, no, You're no. Very generous, You're welcome. Man. You're welcome. 30 for the books, then, and 15 for the door knocker. Very generous indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. You're more than welcome. Lovely to meet you. Bye-bye. Paul's spent £90 today, leaving him with 110 for tomorrow. But the day is not yet done. Margie's been waiting for Paul in Longleat. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. These guys need some fish. Oh, look at that one. This is fun, isn't it? <laughs> oh, there's a big one here. There's a big one here. Look. Look. She's quite an expert now, isn't she? OK, ready? <laughs> oh, can you imagine catching that? Even the sea lions are laughing. What a super way to end the day. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It is indeed. <laughs> Nighty night, you two. Morning, all. Today, Margie's in full control at the wheel. You know, I've absolutely no idea where we are, Paul. Wiltshire. Oh, Wiltshire. Well, you're in safe hands. This is my home county. And lovely it is, too. But hang on, who's this on the back seat? <laughs> That is my lucky tiger. Oh. <laughs> oh, isn't it sweet? I'm superstitious that it has to drive him any car of mine. Really, he's, he only lives in the boot, so oh. nobody sees him, because he's not very handsome, is he? I think he is, <laughs> in his beat-up, squashed way. <laughs> I'm quite honoured to actually hold him. Ah, uh -uh. Paul was all business yesterday. He acquired some Whatcom pottery, a Victorian engraving, two illustrated books and a brass door knocker. That is what you call a good door knocker. Leaving him with £110 for today. 
Margie bagged a trio of Vestas and an Edwardian corner cupboard. You hear that old glass? has a different sound. And still has £130 to spend. Those pies are off to Winchcombe for auction, but today's buying begins in Corsham. Having dropped Paul off, Margie's on her way to the aforementioned town, which incidentally posed as 18th century Truro in the recent remake of the TV series Poldark. Oh, I do love period drama. Ooh, look, a peacock. Chairman Antiques specialises in 17th to 19th century furniture. Looks like a beautiful shop to me. <laughs> Certainly is. Andrew's the man in charge. Got to have eyes in the back of your head in shops like this. Because everywhere you look, you see something interesting. A singularly eclectic mix, to be sure. Guess what this is made of? Do tell. Camel dung. <laughs> <laughs> This 50, an Indian bowl made of camel dung, £55. <sighs> Unusual. <laughs> Nothing to be sniffy about. Ah. Oh, that's gorgeous, isn't it? Bible box, 1751. Amazing, but that was constructed so well that they survive. Isn't that beautiful? The family Bible was incredibly important to the family. Oh, the lovely iron lock. Beautiful. And it's got the initials of the owner and the date. That's really lovely. And the price is, can't buy it, it's £1,400. Worth every penny, actually. Beautiful. Agreed. But anything a little less pricey, Mudgy? Oh, these fascinate me, these. A declamania, it's called. And it's sort of like... It's a form of decoration by sticking these things on the end. I just don't know how they do it. 485, don't drop it, 485 pounds. <laughs> Moving swiftly along. That's quite interesting, isn't it? He's a great little chap, isn't he? He is, articulated. May Absolutely, pick, pick please up? pick him up, absolutely. So he's some kind of soldier, isn't he? He's called an Ascari. You've been doing your homework. The Ascari were native soldiers. I suspect Quite he's, attractive, isn't he's it? West African. It's very primitive and primitive. Yeah. yeah. They're tactile, they're nice, they're great yeah. things. 1915, something like that. Mm. I think you'll find they're quite sought after. Mm. Well, I've never heard of Ascari. We have now. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, you learn something every time. Yeah. I like his face. I like his little wiggly arms. She seems quite taken with the little fellow, doesn't she? <laughs> so, how much is it, Andrew? He's marked up for 65. Yeah. I'm going to do you a very good deal on it. Yeah. 35. Oh, wow. No arguments. I I've got to take him back for that, haven't I? That's very kind of you. I just think he's interesting. I'm going to pay you £35. Andrew, thanks very much indeed. Oddly, everything Margie's bought has cost £35 so far, <laughs> leaving her with £95 for the next shop. Oh. He looks comfy. Meanwhile, Paul has headed for Chippenham to find out about the town's 100-year association with safety on our railways, something we take for granted now, but it was only made possible because of the innovations and ingenuity of local Victorian signal makers and engineers. The man in the know is railway historian Mark Glover. From the development of the railways in the 1830s and throughout the 19th century, there was just a succession of railway accidents that occurred for a number of reasons. They wouldn't have all been sold by Sidling, but a lot of them would have been. On the 12th of June, 1889, in Armagh, in Ulster, two trains collided. 80 people lost their lives and 260 were injured, including many children, on a Sunday school excursion. It was the United Kingdom's worst rail disaster of the 19th century. Two months later, the 1889 Regulation of Railways Act was passed, making signalling compulsory across the network. So when was railway signalling invented and, and who invented it? Around 1850, there was a, a railway engineer called John Saxby who came up with a, a way of interlocking points and signals to make them safe. And by interlocking, we mean he connected the trackside bits and pieces, the points, the signals, the level crossings, to levers in a signal box. 
So basically you couldn't tell two drivers going in opposite directions that it was safe to go towards each other when it clearly wasn't. The Railways Act generated a surge in companies making the newfangled signalling system and Chippenham was leading the way. A high-tech startup, Evans O'Donnell, found an empty patch of land here in Chippenham in the 1890s that had previously been used by one of Isambard Kingdom Brunel's subcontractors when he built the Great Western Railway, and they built a factory there. That's a wonderful heritage, isn't it, for the firm? It's a fantastic, fantastic heritage. O'Donnell's became one of the major players in signalling equipment, merging in the 1900s to become the Westinghouse Brake and Saxby Signal Company. Catchy. In its 1970s heyday, around 7,000 locals were employed here. You'd have done your apprenticeship, you'd have probably met your other half there, you'd have probably got married with wow. Westinghouse people there, your kids would have gone to a Westinghouse supported school, you'd have probably retired at 65, you'd have met the MD for the first and last time, shook his hand, got a gold watch, and from <laughs> what we can see, probably dropped dead two or three years later, sure. because your whole life was led there. So it was a really important part of the local community here. It was absolutely part of the community Vital. here. And all the while, signalling technology was developing in leaps and bounds, from people pulling levers to 21st century electronics and computers that are still being made on the same site today. I'm really looking forward to seeing this. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Where are we now? We're in the integration facility, which is where we bring all the systems together for a complicated railway. We use simulations, like the one you see in front of you, to simulate the view that the driver has. We have the control centre so that the operators can pretend to be controlling the railway. And we use real kit so that we can make sure that it all functions together as it should do when things are working well and when things aren't working so well as well. Right, so you can invent scenarios which might happen, like obstacles on the track, so you put the driver to the test and the system to the test. Absolutely right, Paul. Can we run something up and can I have a go at this? Absolutely, you can drive the train. Oh, lucky ducky. Take it away, Paul. Our lives are in your hands. And there we go, we are moving. It's not a Jaguar, but it's close. <laughs> Right, we're in a tunnel now. So should I take the speed down a bit? Yeah, you could do. So you see you in the station now? Yes. You see the screen doors along the side of the platform? Hopefully not too many passengers wanted to get on there. No, what we'll do is we'll stop at the next one. <laughs> that was a request stop. That's a request stop. <laughs> if you say so, Paul. <laughs> it's quite amazing, really, isn't it? It's not a toy. This is not a toy. It's great fun but it is a vital and essential piece of technology developed here. Absolutely. Used worldwide. Absolutely. Something we as passengers travelling on a train today take for granted. Quite right. And take that back to the history we saw at Chipman Museum, where we saw those really early 1850s inventions. Compare that to this world. Yes. Yeah. Streets ahead. But we've had that continuous progression here in Chipman. But the concept's still here, the skills are still here. And long may it continue. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Back in the Jag, Margie's on top of the world. Oh, how lucky am I? Everybody looks at the car, makes you feel very, very important. <laughs> oh. Well, Margie the Great is heading to Tetbury with its right royal neighbours. Prince Charles's Highgrove residence is nearly minutes away. Our ladyship has got £95 to spend in top banana antiques with items from more than 50 dealers. Wow, where do I start? <laughs> First cabinet on your right. Very, very smart in here. It's smart. This place is crammed with stuff, both small and, well, humongous. <laughs> so I'm five foot nine. So it's five foot six, about seven foot high that, isn't it? Four, seven foot six. It's sold anyhow, so I'm not looking there. <laughs> Wouldn't fit in a jag anyway. Oh, delightful. That's interesting. Ah. Oh, these, are quite, these can be quite good. Oh, it's got quite a bit of weight as well. Right, so this is a fire screen, isn't it? Which lifts up like that. Spoil my nail varnish. Here we go. There. That's okay, isn't it? Oh, look at that. That's quite nice. That's a jolly good clean. 
it's quite good because the price has attracted me. And the price is £48, so that's within budget. Let me take a look from... Nice detail here. Sort of like 50 years old. There doesn't seem to be anything much wrong with it, apart from it's absolutely filthy. I think she likes it. Let's see how Paul's doing, also in Tetbury, but just around the corner. Um, what's he up to? Mmm. That's delicious. Oi, you're not here to scoff. Yeah, I've got to go shopping, but then, you know, you can't shop on an empty stomach. I feel good now. I know I'm going to find something brilliant. Well, you'd better get on with it. There's no stopping Margie today. Another room full of shiny, sparkly things. <laughs> Woo! Right, let's just have a look and see what's for me. Oh, he looks nice, doesn't he? Dogs are always very popular. Cold painted bronze, can't see any, any signatures of anybody. But he's nicely cast. He's a lovely spaniel. Yes, he is. Lovely boy. And it's cold painted, which means that it's painted after the whole thing's been fired. Ah, uh, he's seventy-eight pounds, which is. I'm sure it's worth it, but it's whether I can afford it. Although Margie has ninety-five pounds, she's also rather keen on that peacock fire screen, priced at forty-eight pounds. While she deliberates, Paul has finally got himself round to Trilogie Antiques. Almost closing time. Early English settle. Settle down now. <laughs> you know, that's nice. That's a genuine original paint. A little collection box, a little offering box. This is nice, it's made of mahogany, it's a Cuban mahogany. And I'd say this is circa 1815, somewhere around there, it's Regency, 1830 at the latest. I mean, these things date back to the 16th century, even earlier. You know, small primitive ones made of oak and elm, sort of cobbled together, but with centuries of use. It's that patina, that's what you want to buy into it. I'm looking for genuine historical surface. Then it becomes not just a piece of art, but a document of social history. And the thing with this is, it's, it's had its life stripped off and it's been recoated with something else. And I'd say that was done in maybe the 1920s, 1930s. For me, it doesn't feel right. When you touch it, it doesn't sort of tick all the boxes. It doesn't have that, what we call the touch. So I'll pass on that. Fair enough. Now, we left Margie with two possible items and not enough money to buy them. Walter's the man in charge. That brass, like, peacock. Oh, yes, that's that, lovely, yeah. very nice. That's 48. Mm. That's 48, and yeah. And then what I really like is the bronze spaniel that was 78. And I've only got £95. OK, you know, let me just do a couple of calculations and I'll... Keeping me in suspense, Walter. Yes, you can do it. You can do it? Yeah. Very Great. good. The two for 95. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very kind 38 for the peacock and 57 for the doggy. Seven, eight, 95. Walter, I can't thank you enough. It's been a pleasure it's meeting nice. you. Um, I shall be back. <laughs> Margie's all spent up, but Paul's a little behind for some reason. I like this, tribal figure. It's an African tribal figure. It's Ethnographica, we call this, and it ticks the boxes for me. It's definitely from the African nations. I don't know which one, and it's not tourist wear, OK? This has not been brought back in the 1960s. This is circa, looking at that, around about 1880, 1860, at its earliest. This would have been brought back to England by, you know, mariners. It's quite striking the way it stands. And it does stand, you know, it does stand. That's important. All of a sudden now it becomes a piece of sculpture. I love it. Absolutely love that expression. I don't want to put it down. You'll have to let it go for the auction, old bean. Ticket price, £55. Right, I'm going to find Sarah and see what I can get it for. Gosh, what was in the cake apart from sugar? <laughs> Sarah? Hi, Paul, I'm here. Oh, hello. I found something. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes. I, I love its honesty. You've got £55 on the ticket. Can you do any better than that? I can. Just £50. Could you do £45? 
<laughs> well, OK, yeah. we'll do, yes. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. I'll grab it at £45. I'll pay you straight away. I'll put that down. And with that, the shopping is over for the trip. Our companionable chums are reunited at last. I've had another good day. So good. I just thoroughly enjoyed myself. We noticed. Well, I've, I've bumbled along, you know. I've bumbled along. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite happy. I will start to get worried tonight, <laughs> thinking about the auction. <laughs> Look. What will be, will be. Exactly. But for now, bit of shut eye, eh? Auction day is upon us, and after their county hopping between Somerset, Wiltshire and the Cotswolds, our classy connoisseurs are parking up in Bristol's Great Western Dockyard while they'll watch their goodies going under the hammer. How about this for a location for Amazing, and an amazing day. We're on the bow of SS Great Britain. Gorgeous, aren't we lucky? We are. Their items have travelled on to Winchcombe, home to British bespoke auctions. Nicholas Granger is the auctioneer, accompanied by Bella the parrot. <laughs> have any of Margie's five lots on which she spent every penny of her £200 caught Nicholas's eye? Corner cupboards are really nice. Unfortunately, they can be the kiss of death. This is unusual, though, because it can be used for display. It's got some beautiful Edwardian inlay. Yeah, I think that'll do OK. Paul shelled out £135 on his five lots. Victorian engravings have just really gone down in value, so we've really got to get lucky with someone who likes girls and dogs. See how it goes. Rightio. The auction is open to online and commission bids from around the world. And yes, Bella will be an equal participant from her perch. Pretty Polly? Right. First lot of the trip pulls 19th century volumes on the history of power generators. Anybody buying them will buy them for the bindings. Unusual, these. Yeah. Very, very specialised. <gasps> Come on, Mr. Auction. £12, £12 on the net, £12 looking for 15 looking for 15 At £12, do we have 15 At £12, 15 hey. and 16 looking for 17 oh, now, looking for 17 16 17 18 19 20 and 5 we're asking. £30 and 5 and 40 hey. and 40 Climbing. Well, a at £40 then, going to give fair warning at 40 once and twice, selling then at £40. Yes! Yes! That's a fine start for Paul. Profit. Profit. Well done. Margie's turn now. It's her cold painted bronze spaniel. Right, come on, doggy. Is, and we're on the net straight away at 55. 55, now looking for 60. We're asking for 60 pounds. <gasps> Anyone out there for the spaniel at 60? Oh, no. for another five pounds. And we're selling them at 55. Oh. 55 twice. Are we sure? <laughs> Sold to net. Lost two pounds. Nice. Cute little fella. What a shame. Could have been worse. Sold. Oh. And here's Paul's canine related item, his Victorian hand coloured engraving. At £20, we have a home. At £20, anyone at £25? <gasps> we have 20 Do we have 25 I'll sell it 20 then. I liked it. Yeah. You know, it got its money back. You can't win them all. There's more to come. There's, There's more, more to, to come. come. There's more to come. There's more to come. <laughs> Indeedy, such as Margie's Vesta collection, including that silver-plated piggy. Very nice. £40 on the internet already. We've got a match case. We've got a pig match case in the form of a pig. Very unusual. And a little stamp box. Lovely little item. <gasps> Surely it's got to be worth more for the three items. At £40 bid on the net. At £40 then. It's been a good day for me. Not a meaty profit, but better than nout. So that's all right. That's OK. It's all right. I'm happy. Good old. Paul's East African standing figure is up. Next. At £20, we have commission. At 20 at 20 looking for five now. Looking for five. At £20, we have looking for five. Surely that must be worth 25 <gasps> No problem, so. Looking for 25 <gasps> even 25 We will sell at 20 then. If we don't get any more bids, we'll sell at 20 Sold then. Thank oh, this is a loss. Hmm. <laughs> Paul's starting to lose ground a little. Time yet. It's time yet. Got to make it back up. That's the spirit. Now, here's Margie's mid-20th century fire screen. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice fire screen. In the form of a peacock, 
Luckily, not a parrot, otherwise we'd be bidding. And it's at 110 on the net. Right, 110, 120, 130, please. Looking for 130. It's absolutely great. You can put it away. Goodness, Paul, oh, this is brilliant. This, this. Somebody anyway, wanted it. 140, 150. Oh. 150. <laughs> 100. 140 pounds. Oh, 140. Oh, Paul. Oh. So you're looking for 150. <sighs> 140 pounds, then I am going to give you right. This is brilliant. 140 once and twice. Oh, you're going to take some catching. Well done. And Margie romps into a rather healthy lead. The drinks tonight are on me. Mine's a gin and tonic. Ice, no slice, thanks. Now, can Paul's Whatcom Ware close the gap? At £10 on the net, at £10 we do we have five? <sighs> Devon Motorware, £10. It's got to be worth more, surely. Have we got 12 out there? Anyone for £12, I'll be sure. We'll sell it 10 then at £10. At £10. Sold. Oh, you're not being lucky, are you? Least said, soonest mended. I kind of thought, well, if I like them, somebody else might. Hmm, never mind. Moving on. Now, attention, Margie's Ascari soldier. Very interesting and straight in the internet, running at 55 and 60 and looking for five now, looking for five. 60, looking for five. Brilliant. At 60 pound or looking for five. At 60 pound, got to give fair warning and we done at 60. 61, 60 twice, selling, are we sure? At 60 pounds then. Well done you. That's another little nudge upwards for Margie. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? Paul's big brass one. At 20, looking for five. Everyone needs one of these on their front door. At 25 or 30 with me. Oh. And looking for shipping. Looking for five. Looking for 35, 40 with me. Looking for <gasps> 35. At 45, 50 with me. Looking for 55. This is a nice quality piece. Hey, a nice well quality done. piece. At 50 now, 50. Looking for five. Looking for five. At 55, a commission bid. Looking for one more bid out there somewhere. At 50 pounds. And unless we get five. At 50, going once, twice. At 50 pounds, then are we done? Yes! Yes. Well 50 done. quid. A welcome profit for Paul. At last. Hurrah. Very I bet good. you're pleased. You're pleased. I am. I'm chuffed a bit. I bet you are. Ending our auction is Margie and the auctioneer's favourite, the Edwardian corner covered with inlaid decorations. Great for display items. Oh, he's yeah, good, he's isn't good. he? Very nice. A lot of you bidding out. Nice. £100, looking for 120 Brilliant. Uh, 120 £170, £180, £190 now, looking oh. for 90 Oh. Uh, £180. But it's I well worth it. Fair warning, well £90, worth 90, it. £190, £200, £220. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, that, I'm so happy. And it goes on. That's what I love about the internet. What's you out there bidding Don't today? Don't you love a race? Don't you love a race? At 220 once, then. Be quick. 220 twice. Selling then at £220. Are we 220. done? Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yowzers, what a profit. I know I struggle, but, but you've had a great day. I know. He's right, you know. Paul began with £200, and after a few ups and downs, he finished a little down. He takes forward £179 and 80p. But Margie has more than doubled her £200 pot. She takes the win and £422.30 into the next leg. So, well done, girl. The carriage awaits. What a carriage. <laughs>